and thank you for joining the PIDB virtual public meeting. Please note that all audio connections are going to be muted throughout this con uh, conference. conference. Uh, before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx participant and chat panels using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'm going to turn the call over to um, Mark Bradley, Director of the Information Security Oversight Office and the Executive Secretary of the Public Interest Declassification Board. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, welcome. As you can see, we're still working uh, virtually. Um, hopefully, this will end uh, soon. It looks like we're on the right track as a country to get the epidemic or pandemic under control. Now, we're not only doing this uh, on WebEx today, we're also streaming live over NARA's YouTube channel. We've got over 1,000 uh, people today watching, so we are very excited we had such an enthusiastic uh, crowd who wants to attend. Before we get started, I'd like to update you just on a bit of, uh, of Information Security Oversight Office business. I anticipate delivering ISOO's annual report to the president in June. Uh, clearly, the pan pandemic has had a deep impact on the executive branch uh, information security programs, and that's going to be the focus of our uh, report this year. If nothing else, I hope it, again, serves as a siren call uh, how badly this system, meaning the classification, declassification, and information security systems need to be modernized. As always, the report will be available on ISOO's website for public uh, review. I think of all the ones I've been involved with, I think this one will be the most interesting to, uh, to read. Now let's talk uh, a bit about today's meeting. This is the first public meeting for, boards, for the board's new chair, Ezra Cohen. Ezra was appointed to the board and designated as chair by President Trump in January 2021. Before his appointment, he served in senior leadership positions at the Department of Defense, the Intelligence Community, and the White House brings his experience in military intelligence and national security to the board. It's also the first public meeting for Ben Powell and Michael Lawrence, uh, appointed by the president in October, and Paul Noel Critian, appointed by the president in December. They have all had distinguished careers in intelligence and national security. So, again, welcome all, and we are delighted to, uh, to have you on the board. During the course of our meeting today, please take the opportunity to submit questions or comments directly to the PIDB email address. And it's PIDB at NARA.gov. Again, PIDB at NARA.gov. We have reserved time for questions, answers, and comments after our speakers. Uh, I know we've already received uh, scores of questions, uh, so if we don't get to your question today during the allotted time, we will post all comments or questions on the PIDB blog, uh, Transforming Classification, along with a response. And now Ezra Cohen will kick off our meeting. Ezra? Thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm honored to have the opportunity to serve on the Public Interest of Classification Board. I have long followed the Board's work. The board performs a critical function in the pursuit of increased government transparency, which includes modernizing our classification and declassification system and advocating for maximum public access to the historical government record. It has been seven months since our last public meeting, and we have a lot of information to talk about today. I'll run through our agenda. First, we'll kick off with the Archivist of the United States, David Carrillo, uh, who will make some remarks. From there, we'll have, uh, we have two very distinguished speakers, uh, Jamie Gorella and uh, Philip Zellico, uh, who were both part of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, also known as the 9-11 Commission. As we approach the 20th anniversary of the mass murder attacks on the United States, the board felt that this was an opportune time to learn more about the commission's records and advocate for the expedient public public access to these documents. After we hear from the speakers, we will discuss the board's letter to President Biden. Next, we will have several new board members who have joined us since our last public meeting, as Mark mentioned, and we will introduce them and give each of them an opportunity to make some comments. We will then conclude our public meeting by listening to your comments and answering questions. It is not too late to submit a question, as Mark mentioned. You can do so by emailing, again, the, the address is PIDB at NARA, 
inbox.gov. Uh, we will have staff monitoring the inbox uh, throughout the meeting. The agenda and the biographies of our guest speakers can be found on our website. And I invite all of you to both visit our website and sign up for our Transforming Classification blog. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, the archivist um, um, uh, of the United States, uh, David Ferrio. Thanks, Ezra. And greetings from the National Archives Building in downtown Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotch Tanks people. I'd like to welcome the and thank the 9-11 Commission member Jamie Gorelick and Executive Director Philip Zelico for speaking at this important meeting today. The records of the 9-11 Commission are part of the collections in our Center for Legislative Archives. The Legislative Archives staff are charged with preserving and making these records available to the public. And like me, they believe that access to these important records help promote a better understanding of what led up to the attacks that happened on that terrible day. I'd also like to welcome PIDIB's newest members who are participating in their first public meeting, Michael Lawrence, Paul Noel Cratian, and PIDIB's new chair, Ezra Cohen. Welcome to all of you, and I look forward to working with you. While the pandemic disrupted our operations as it did all of government, I'm proud of how our staff reacted to this challenge. We've reprioritized and reimagined our work. Although our research rooms and museums have been closed, we added and upgraded our online presence. Our edu education staff developed new resources to support teachers and aid virtual learning. We increased public engagement on YouTube Live and other platforms. We added more authors to our book series and created a Young Learners program. On History Hub, our staff continued to answer thousands of questions from researchers. Online, our catalog added over 120 million digital objects attached to item and file descriptions. And received, we received over 163 million monthly views of our records on Wikipedia. Meanwhile, we are also sticking to our roots with our museum starting to reopen this last weekend and with the research, pilot, research room pilot starting next week. There are three important projects I'd like to quickly highlight today. First, the National Archives is on track to publicly release the 1950 U.S. Census next year on April 1st. In preparation, our staff scanned almost 8 million population schedule pages. We've added online programs on genealogy, and our staff is completing additional archival and IT work necessary to improve the user experience when the census is released. Second, the National Archives received legal custody of the Trump presidential records on June 20th of this year in accordance with the Presidential Records Act. It was a tremendous amount of work under difficult circumstances, and I commend our staff for rising to the challenge to transfer physical materials during a pandemic. The process to transfer over 500 terabytes of electronic records is complex and remains ongoing. Ensuring compatibility of formats, then verifying its authenticity is time-consuming and requires <coughs> close collaboration with White House information technology staff in order to allow us to ingest this data into the National Archives Electronic Records Archive. And third, last month, the National Archives received letters from other federal agencies in accordance with the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992. My staff has already started to review their request to continue to postpone the public release of certain JFK assassination records beyond October 2021. This work will continue through the summer, and we will carefully evaluate each request. As Archivist of the United States, my responsibility is to make recommendations to the President based on the strict standards established in the Act. I take this responsibility very seriously and believe firmly in the Act's ultimate objectives to make all of the records in this collection available to the public. The mission of the National Archives is to drive openness, cultivate public participation, and strengthen our nation's democracy through public access to high-value government records. In short, make access happen. Let me close with an optimistic note. Despite the recent challenges, all of us who work at the National Archives believe 
democracy starts here. I'm pleased how our staff across the country has reprioritized work so that our users can still receive information electronically and access important government records virtually. But I'm also looking forward to a return when I can welcome the American people in person as they use our research rooms and visit our exhibits to learn more about our great nation and our democracy. Our facilities are slowly and carefully reopening in accordance with local conditions and guidelines put in place by the administration. This progress will continue, and I'm looking forward to more of our museum exhibits and research rooms opening in the coming months. Thanks for joining us today. David, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, David is leading the charge to modernize the government record-keeping practices and promoting improved public access to records here at the National Archives. He also is a longtime uh, supporter of the PIDB's work and is very interested in everything that the board, uh, the board does. As Ezra highlighted for us this afternoon, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on New York City and on the Pentagon on September 11, uh, 2001. I am pleased that we have a unique opportunity to discuss the historical significance and access status of records relating to the terrorist attacks upon the United States on 9-11. We have two distinguished speakers this afternoon who served in the 9-11 Commission, Commissioner Jamie Gorelick and the 9-11 Commission Executive Director, Professor uh, Philip Zelico. They are both accomplished public servants who have excelled in the private sector and in academia. The full biographies can be found on the PIDB website on the page for this meeting. We will first hear from uh, Jamie Gorelick. In addition to her work on the commission, Ms. Gorelick has also had a renowned career in the federal government, serving leadership roles in the Department of Justice, Defense, and Energy. Jamie, on behalf of the board members, we are pleased to have you join us today. The uh, floor is yours, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very, very glad to be here, and I congratulate you on this worthy effort that you're, that you're making. Um, I would uh, say at the outset that um, it has been 17 years since the 9-11 Commission completed its work, and during that uh, period of time, the cicadas have all been buried in the earth, and they are reemerging uh, in Washington as we speak, as they come back every 17 years. So I think this is somehow a symbol of, of, of reemergence and transparency and light that this uh, board is 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 trying to help uh, uh, shed on hard issues. Um, I was, uh, as the chair noted, uh, a member of the commission. Uh, Philip, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, was our uh, esteemed executive director. We had an excellent staff. The commissioners were supposed to be part time. And uh, sometimes I was part-time, but for a lot of it, I was more than full-time. I probably, because of my legal training or otherwise, dug into the facts maybe more than, than some of the others. And there were plenty of facts to say grace over. Uh, you know, we looked at, I don't know, easily over a million documents. We did somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200, Philip will correct me, uh, um, interviews, suffice it to say that this was the <clears throat> broadest, deepest look at the national security apparatus of this country that we've ever had, and we've had some pretty uh, deep and broad looks. So what is the relevance or the possible relevance to today of, uh, of the records that remain um, uh, classified and not released to the public? Um, so I would, um, I would try to answer that um, uh, in, in, in the form of four, four questions. Um, one is, and I think the first and foremost question would be, how did the different elements of our national security community relate to one another? And, um, you know, was there anything that inhibited close coordination and effectiveness? And... And then to ask, are there um, structural issues that were resolved, and are there structural issues uh, that have not been resolved? Um, 
the 9-11 commissioners formed uh, themselves into a group called the 9-11 Public Discourse Project, the purpose of which was to help get our recommendations uh, enacted. Uh, and uh, over the year after our report was issued in, in, uh, in 2004, we did that. We were pretty successful in having a bipartisan acceptance of our, of our recommendations. Uh, all but one, uh, I would say, uh, achieved that status and were enacted, and it won't surprise you that the one that wasn't enacted was a recommendation that went to the oversight structure in the Congress. Uh, Congress was really good at accepting our changes with respect to the executive branch, not so much uh, as to itself. Uh, and after that, we got together periodically to see how our recommendations had been, had been implemented. So I think it would be helpful to the American people to look back at what we were worried about. Obviously, a lot of it is in our report, uh, which I think is still used in, uh, in uh, colleges and universities today. Uh, but um, some of the underlying records, I think, would be uh, of use as they documented the, the debates that we had. Um, and that leads to the second question, which is, how has the Director of National Intelligence worked out? We've had several of them now. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and, and Ben Powell was the general counsel to the first cohort of them. Uh, I think it's fair to say that each one of them did the job in a different way. The offices were uh, um, uh, organized in a different way. The sense of purpose was, was different. Uh, and so I think it might be helpful to look at our deliberations uh, as to what was envisioned by the commission. Uh, what, what issues were we trying to resolve? And how do the various iterations of the DNI comport with what we thought needed to be needed to be done. Um, the third is a little more of a global question, which is whether there are lessons uh, to be learned about the differences between the first draft of history and the truth. Um, and you might want to study the story that was first told to us about the plane that was heading for the Capitol, United 93, and how the Air Force said it was tracking the plane and was prepared to shoot it down uh, had the Capitol been threatened. And uh, NORAD testified that it was ready to intercept uh, uh, American uh, 77 and uh, United 93. Both statements turned out to be wrong. Whether they were intentionally false is a, is a whole other question, but um, the, the people who who, who gave us those stories had ample opportunity to gather the facts. It wasn't like they were talking to us um, just off the top of their heads, and yet the, the presentation of uh, organizations as really on top of things turned out to be wrong. And that has some lessons as we think about a COVID commission or a January 6th commission or any look back. Um, I uh, am now, despite being uh, an optimistic person, uh, I am also, uh, uh, I also should be counted among the skeptics when I hear uh, these first drafts of, uh, of history. Um, and then the question I'm sure that uh, this board really wants to look at is, are there particular bits of history uh, yet in the archives that would be especially enlightening? And I know Philip uh, is much more familiar with what has been declassified and released and what is not. But I would say that um, our memorandum, the one that Philip and I were asked to do for the, for the commission as a whole upon review of the presidential daily briefs, would be uh, most interesting. Um, uh, there were uh, two drafts. Uh, Philip, I think, only remembers the the one that uh, he led the drafting of. I also remember one that I led the drafting of. Uh, the, his was the one we ended up briefing the uh, commission on because mine um, was not uh, permitted to be released. But the interesting story to me about that 
uh, about that memo uh, uh, was that we, what we did was we looked at all the data we had from the intelligence community, particularly the CIA, who led the briefing processes for the executive branch. So we had all of that. And so the question was, how was all of that distilled and presented to the president and the most senior uh, national security officials? That, I think, is a really interesting question because, you know, the senior most uh, uh, decision makers can only make good decisions if they are getting the real uh, story. Uh, and, and the decisions that the briefers make about what to include and what not and how they phrase it and not, I think, are really uh, important. Uh, second uh, are interviews with the two presidents, President Clinton and President Bush. We interviewed President Bush uh, uh, with uh, uh, Vice President Cheney at their, at their request. Um, we, there were some factual issues about whether the Vice President had actually consulted the, uh, uh, President Bush on a shoot-down order. That would be uh, interesting. The Bush administration's attitude toward counterterrorism uh, the, with respect to the Clinton administration, um, the, uh, the reasoning behind its decision-making on um, administration actions in retribution for the coal bombing, which took place in the Clinton administration, but right toward the end of it. Um, and, uh, and one could construe the, the, the coal bombing as a, as a, uh, an opening uh, shot in, 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 that culminated in the attacks of 9-11. Um, uh, and there, I think, one of the questions is, what was the effect of the presidential transition uh, on our ability to address the bombing of the coal? Um, and what perils are there as we are moving from one president to another, particularly from one party to another? Uh, I think the question of the degree to which the CIA actually warned the NSC, whether there were warnings uh, above and beyond the actual presidential daily briefs, should be very, uh, very interesting. Um, I have a personal interest in the Department of Justice, and I would think that the details on whether John Ashcroft uh, did everything he could on, on, uh, to fight uh, terrorism would be interesting. Um, what was the uh, nature of the disagreement that we heard about between the FBI and uh, Attorney General Ashcroft uh, in the first part of the Bush administration? Uh, I think it would be particularly interesting to see the progress that the FBI has made on the journey to more effectively uh, addressing foreign terrorism. And then last, um, we, the only witnesses that we wanted to hear from, whom we did not uh, hear from directly, were the detainees at Guantanamo. Uh, and I think looking at the CIA's decision uh, that we could not do that uh, would, be, uh, would be of interest. So th that's my list. I'm sure that Philip has a more comprehensive uh, uh, list, but maybe between the two of us, we can inform your recommendations in some helpful way. Thank you. Shall I go ahead and start? Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Now I'm pleased to introduce Bill Zellico. He served in senior roles at the Department of State and the White House before serving as the Executive Director of the 9-11 Commission. He now wears several hats at the University of Virginia, one of my alma maters, where he serves as a director of the Miller Center for Public Affairs, the dean of the Graduate School, both as a professor of history and professor of governance. Bill, on behalf of the board members, welcome. We look forward to hearing your perspective on the work of the commission. Please uh, take the floor. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm glad to have the chance to appear before the Public Interest Declassification Board and the interested members of the public. The uh, historical value of the 9-11 Commission records is, I think, obvious to anyone 
who thinks that the 9-11 episode itself is historically significant. Um, Jamie Gorelick did a good job of introducing this subject, and I won't want to re recapitulate what she went through. Um, what I will stress is that the chair and vice chair of the commission, Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton, felt very strongly about the public release of the commission records. Um, they and we did everything we could to try to be sure that those records would be made available to the public uh, reasonably soon after the commission finished its work. Uh, they're not with you today, but uh, I'll say this. Uh, Tom Kane is an even-tempered person, but if you want to name one subject that can get him riled up and angry, talk to him about the release of the 9-11 commission records, because he is upset that those records 17 years later while the cicadas have been in their long sleep, um, that the records have shared that life underground uh, in so many cases with them. So um, in our view, all these records should be made available, really. Uh, now to just be very strategic about it, uh, the board has asked us to identify some records to focus on the release of which might be uh, the most strategically or historically significant since there are uh, hundreds of records that have not yet been released. And, her uh, and, and the list that she presented is a list that I agree with. Number one, uh, the document that she and I prepared that is uh, an authoritative summary of the high-level intelligence about the al-Qaeda threat and terrorist threat available to the President of the United States in the three years before 9-11. Um, we insisted on and got access to all the presidential daily briefs related to that subject for those three years. Also, um, we were able to compare those with another high-level intelligence document that at that time was usually called the National Intelligence Daily, uh, which had a wider distribution. And um, we finally wrote up a summary of that material that is 7,000 words long, um, and quite rigorous and concise. Uh, Kane and Hamilton themselves went into the records to verify that Jamie and I had done an adequate job of representing them. That 7,000 word memo was then shared with all the members of the commission who reviewed it very carefully. And then under the agreement that was negotiated with the White House for the access to these records, uh, we believe that, that uh, the copies of that memorandum were returned to the National Security Council for their safekeeping. All these records were actually accessed in the executive office of the president, in, in one of the uh, executive office buildings. So um, that is an, uh, an authoritative summary of the intelligence about the threat that was available to the president of the United States in writing and to other top officials in the three years before 9-11. That's valuable. And uh, having prepared that document myself, I can tell you there's nothing in that document I think that could not now be safely released. Uh, second, uh, the record of our interview uh, with uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Uh, I was the note taker for that meeting. I drafted the record. I got all the other commissioners to give me their notes. I then shared with them the memorandum that I'd written up to see if they agreed that, it, uh, that the meeting had been accurately represented. It's a very detailed uh, memorandum, um, uh, quite extensive for that meeting with Bush and Cheney. I understand there is a parallel record that was created by the NSC's lawyer, Brian Cunningham, and um, both of those records should be available and, and be released. Uh, they are, uh, I think, provide some real insight about the attitudes of, above all, Bush, because Bush did most of the talking in the interview. Also, the, commission's, the records of the commission's interview with former President Bill Clinton. If one is interested, we also did an interview with former Vice President Gore, which I think is historically not as significant. The interview with uh, former President Clinton actually was both written up as a prose summary and I believe was recorded and at least and transcribed, at least in part. So um, that's a, a fairly extensive record and is uh, has some historically valuable material, and in part perhaps for things that were not said. If you go below those three records, um, 
there are a whole series of memoranda for the records and other documents that might be of interest. I'd especially single out our records of our interviews with former CIA Director George Tenet, with the NSC Director for Counterterrorism, Richard Clark. We did three interviews with Clark, all of which were written up quite extensive documents. The head of the CIA, Bin Laden unit, Michael Scheuer, um, various cabinet officials in both the Clinton and Bush administrations, um, and so on. On the detainee issues that uh, Jamie mentions, our records have quite an interesting call it back and forth, uh, where we were attempting to obtain more and more information from the CIA about the detainees. The detainees of interest to us, Jamie made us slightly misspoke. She alluded to the detainees being at Guantanamo. At that time, they were not at Guantanamo. At that time, they were at CIA black sites. And the existence of these sites had not yet been publicly revealed. And uh, we actually wanted to directly examine these people ourselves. Um, uh, and actually, the staff felt very strongly about that, made that argument. Ultimately, the commissioners decided, for their reasons, uh, not to insist on that and not to subpoena or file other uh, legal action to get access to the detainees, but instead to uh, go along with an accommodation in which the commission would put in its questions for the detainees. The CIA would ask those questions, relay answers back to us, and we would go through that process. Um, it is worth noting in that context that one of the other recommendations that the Bush administration did not adopt was our recommendation to uh, end the CIA black sites for the detainees and to uh, bring the detainees under the rules of war and uh, uh, treat them in accordance with the law of war um, under common article three of the different Geneva conventions. In 2004, that was also a recommendation that the Bush administration was unwilling to accept. Um, it did finally, by the way, uh, have to uh, accept that recommendation and follow that policy in a series of decisions at the end of 2005 and during 2006. I was involved in those from a, uh, in those arguments from another perspective. So those are, that's all I'll uh, cover for now. What I wanna do for the board then is simply stress the significance of these records, the impatience of Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton that they have not been released after all these years, and strategic suggestions to the board that if you wanted to focus on a handful of absolutely critical records to, that should help break the log jam, we can itemize a few and have done so for the board's benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie and Phil, uh, for joining us today and providing us with your insights into the value of specific records in this significant collection. You've, you've offered us new perspectives on the important uh, content of still classified commission records and suggested that there are within this collection critical records that should be considered for prioritized declassification review. I also want to thank you, Phil, for especially highlighting the intent of the, the, the chairman and the co-chairman of the commission, um, and that's, that's really very important. Uh, the board has been collecting information on the status of the 9-11 commission records for the past few months, including learning about the importance of good archival practices and some of the challenges the National Archives and U.S. government face in processing this large collection for declassification and public access. As you can imagine, as many of the records were in paper form, uh, the search for some of the records you mentioned today uh, and, and the processing of them will be a challenge. We also learned uh, throughout our process of the complexities involved in, in, as I said, processing records for declassification. So next I'd like to transition to talk about uh, the letter that the board uh, sent to President Biden last week. Beyond introducing the function of the board and the new administration, the letter also addressed the critical need to modernize our classification and secrecy system. Our letter containing three key points uh, was based primarily on our 2020 report, A Vision for the Digital Age. And the three points are, 
First, our secrecy system is outdated and in danger of failing. The current system does not adequately support our national security professionals, protect our democracy, or provide adequate transparency to the American people, as we heard today from Jamie and Phil. Second, we highlighted recommendations from that report that align with the president's objectives to transition to a modern digital government, including the integration and use of advanced technological tools and information systems across the executive branch. And third, we offered to meet with the president's senior staff to provide assistance and expertise as they begin to address some of the modernization challenges we have already discussed today. We plan to publicize the full letter in the near future, both through our blog and on our website. Now we'll move to member comments. In the last year, several members rotated off the board, and I'd like to publicly thank them for their service and their hard work. Jamie Baker, Trevor Morrison, and Ken Weinstein. Thank you for all that you did. I'd also like to thank Alyssa Starzak for her service as the interim chair of the PITB for the greater part of the past year. We've had several new appointments since our last public meeting, as Mark mentioned in the beginning. Paul Noel, Gretien, Michael Lawrence, and Ben Powell, who were appointed by former President Trump, and Congressman Trey Gowdy, who was appointed by House Minority Leader McCarthy. We will now turn to the members of the board to make comments on the PIDB's objectives or pose questions or comments to our guest speakers today. So with that, we'll first turn to Alyssa, our Chair Emerita. Thank you, Ezra. And I'm so glad to be here today. And thank you, uh, both Jamie and Phil, for coming in to talk about the 9-11 Commission records. It's obviously a historical year, uh, not just because of the cicadas. <laughs> Um, so I uh, really do appreciate um, the, the willingness to come in and talk about it. Um, we share your interest in, in getting the records declassified, and obviously um, if there's a year to do it, but there's a, this is it. Um, so we, we really do look forward to figuring out how we prioritize those records and encourage their declassification. Um, I, I also want to turn to something else um, that we've been talking about a lot as a board, uh, which is just the modernization of classification systems. And I actually think in some ways our 9-11 Commission conversation uh, really sort of highlights the need for it. Um, I think the challenge of even finding documents has been striking to us, um, trying to find the right records, even for something that's a very com uh, discrete collection like the 9-11 Commission, uh, there have been some challenges along the way. Um, and I think that for us, um, when, I, when I sort of look at where we are going as a, as a board um, and where we have been, um, so it really is the striking need to modernize our, um, our systems for both classification and declassification that we can find records, um, uh, ensure that they're released to the public in a much more robust way than we've been able to do in the past. Um, manual systems just don't work anymore with, the, with the, uh, the environment that we have now and the digital architecture we have now. So um, th those are sort of, my, from my standpoint, um, priorities for the board that we'll continue to look at. Um, and I think um, I will turn it over to everyone else for, for comments as well. Thank you, Alyssa. Okay, uh, now we'll turn to uh, Congressman Gowdy. Yeah, Ezra, I just uh, also want to thank Jamie and Phil for their service to our uh, country in particular, and uh, specifically with respect to the 9-11 Commission. Um, I worked in the state and federal um, court systems and then was in the le legislative branch for a little while. I've always been fascinated by the tension between and the need for both uh, access and security. So my interest in serving on this board is trying to strike the right balance between access uh, while also preserving national security. And I could not uh, be uh, more thankful for the chance uh, to work with you and other experts. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate it. Um, ben, go ahead. Ben Powell. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, wanted to thank Jamie and Phil for their very important uh, uh, comments. Uh, I think the records remain a continuing relevance today uh, as we go on 20 years in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan continues to be a place of, of continuing uh, importance and relevance to the national security conversation, as does uh, al-Qaeda 
offshoots of Al Qaeda and understanding the foundations and importance of what happened on 9/11, prior to 9/11, and frankly after 9/11. And as Jamie noted, uh, the transformation of our intelligence community and the continuing national conversation we have about that. Uh, I'm very pleased to join the board and contribute to its important work. I'm certainly heartened by the interest shown in the board's work. We have more than 1,000 registered today and uh, 3,800 uh, watching online on the YouTube broadcast. So I think it is shows that there is a, an interest in the board's work. I won't repeat what Alyssa said except to endorse it. <laughs> Uh, the declassification of records and the challenges is only going to become more challenging uh, given the exponential growth of digital data without a corresponding increase in technology to support the review and declassification of these records. So uh, look forward to contributing to the board's work and, and happy to join it. Thank you, Ben. All right, uh, now we'll turn to uh, Michael Lawrence. Thanks, Astro. Uh, much like the uh, cicadas that have been gone for 17 years, it's been 17 years since I've worked with Jamie and Phil, so it's good to see both of you again and look forward to working with you and picking your brains further on that. And I'm just wondering, either of you, can you provide maybe to the board some suggestions in working with the intel agencies to uh, release some of the information that they have and and techniques that you have used in dealing with them during the commission to help free up some of that information and to give us a glide path to success. Phil, it might be useful for you to talk about the process that we use to get our report out. Uh, as everyone on this uh, board knows, if you try to, if you write a memoir uh, and you try to get it cleared, it can take forever right. to get it out. And uh, I thought Phil was masterful in doing that, and uh, this board might uh, gain some insight from the process you used, Phil. Um, I wish it could. Um, we use the process of pre-publication review. Uh, from a legal point of view, then, our stance was that uh, all of our material was presumptively unclassified, presumptively unclassified, but that we were obligated to give administration officials a chance to review it to see if they agreed with that judgment. Um, that was part of the, that goes with the security agreements to access the information. That's a pre-publication review process in which the presumption is that the material is unclassified. The burden then is on the holders of classified information to make an assertion that something no is classified and needs to be withheld. Um, the situation you're in right now for the declassification of these records is just is turned around. They are taking the position now that these records were created as classified records in the, in the, at the beginning, which is true, and that they are therefore presumptively classified and that you then have to make the push on them to insist that actually they should be unclassified. Um, and basically then inertia runs in their favor. So the only way in which you persuade them to declassify these records is by calling sufficient attention to them that they then exert the time and energy to bother to declassify them. There are cases where there are actual legal requirements that records be declassified after a given period of time. In some cases, that statutory requirement works reasonably well and some agencies are compliant. Um, in some cases, agencies simply flap the law. For example, the behavior of the Department of Defense with respect to the Foreign Relations Series that's published by the State Department's Historian's Office. I will say that the CIA, um, in general and on many issues, does endeavor to be compliant with the law. And the current director of the CIA, Bill Burns, is quite conscious of history and historical responsibilities in some of these classification issues. Since the CIA has lead custody on a lot of the records of interest for our request, I think, in, I think actually, tactically, the best way to approach this is to go right at Bill Burns. Um, and um, I, he'll get it. And I think he'll understand the significance of this. Uh, he is very well equipped 
to do the necessary balancing act on these records. Um, I don't think in this case and for these records, it's a very onerous or time-consuming task. So right. what I was actually suggesting is that this board figure out a way to switch the presumption, the presumption on a greater proportion of the records, which you mm -hmm. could certainly ha have done, for example, with the 9-11 Commission. You could have said these records are presumptively declassified after a period of time, maybe it's 17 years. Yeah, but you uh, might need a law to do that. Yes, you might. But that... Yes, you might need a law to do that, but that is what I'm suggesting because when the presumption was reversed, uh, we were able to tell our story pretty well with some, I would say, deft editing. Well, that was uh, that was very helpful. Thank you, uh, Philip and Jamie, and, and it's actually a perfect... Uh, uh, transition to uh, Paul Noel, who has uh, a lot of firsthand experience with the uh, Publication Review Board at uh, CIA. Paul, go ahead. Thank you, Ezra, and thank you, Jamie and Phil, for your work on the commission. We appreciate it. I'll just uh, summarize my background. I came from the Department of Justice, where I litigated FOIA and Privacy Act cases. And then I moved over to the CIA, where I did a lot of declassification work and pre-publication review work. I think it's interesting work, and it's important work, and we should release as much as we possibly can for the American people to see. I look forward to working with my colleagues on prioritizing uh, what we can uh, expect the government to release, and I look forward to working with the administration on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Noel. Um, last but not least, uh, Congressman Tierney. Well, thank you, Ezra, and uh, thank all my colleagues for the hard work that they do, and that means past colleagues as well as the uh, current ones that are newly appointed. But I want to thank the staff, too, because they do just an absolutely fantastic job of supporting the work that the PIDB does. Uh, and I think that what's interesting and, and heartwarming for somebody like myself, and I think Trey Gowdy mentioned it as well, is to see the focus of this board and all of its members realizing that the real grind should be toward releasing these records whenever it's possible and whenever it's safe under our security constraints uh, and just to make sure that all those government records see the light of day. Uh, I would adopt all the things that all the previous members said on that, but I would just add that on September 9th of last year, 2020, I had the opportunity to represent the PIDB before the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence and we were talking mostly about the records and the need to uh, have them declassified and the importance and, and how it's often neglected as an issue. But the fact that the security classification, declassification system needs serious reform. We've done, I think, five reports in the last dozen years, and all of them come to the same conclusion, that modernization is something that is definitely needed. Uh, the number of records and the work that it would take to digitize them, uh, it's just impossible to do without new technology being applied in modernizing the system, I, I stress to the Senate uh, there's a critical importance of there being sustained leadership in making sure that that gets done. Somebody has to drive the change. Uh, and there needs to be an executive agent, somebody that will actually go in and coordinate the across the federal government effort at this aspect. Uh, I testified at that time, and I believe it's still with the recommendation of this full board, uh, that the Director of National Intelligence, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, would be the appropriate agency to do that. Uh, it's the one agency that has the knowledge, it has the experience, uh, it understands all of the sensitive uh, equities that are applied uh, in this responsibility, and it has the resources and the stature uh, to get people to cooperate and move in that direction. Uh, that is in the intent of the board. Uh, that is our hope that we get to the modernization and bring in new technologies, all with the effort and the end result of making sure that as much as is absolutely uh, possible, sees the light of day and, and the public is allowed to see what's going on in our government, what has gone on in the government. So, again, thanks to my colleagues, thanks to the staff, and thanks for today's two witnesses for their enlightening testimony as well. Thank you, Congressman Tierney. I'll just make a few comments, and, and I have a question uh, as well. Uh, first, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to examine, also examine the use of technology to modernize 
the classification and declassification system in the United States. We must modernize to protect our national security and support our democracy. This is an imperative. The process we use to classify, declassify, and safeguard information remain largely the same as when President Truman first enacted them in 1951, when secrets were still created on paper and stored in combination safes. There is widespread agreement that this system is at a breaking point. As the variety and volume of digital data increase exponentially, classification, declassification, <clears throat> and information management policies and processes have not kept pace and no longer meet the needs of national security professionals who require rapid and agile information sharing and dissemination to keep our nation safe. Along with the other members, I look forward to providing support to the President of the United States and his administration in addressing this challenge. Now, one of the things that the board has recommended in the past is training. Uh, and, and so for, for Jamie and Phil, uh, I'd like your take on whether or not uh, classification training, looking forward here as, as we continue to encounter historical events that uh, you know, events that will have historical value. Uh, do you think that classification training and a greater emphasis on keeping information unclassified at the start, so that going back to that presumption, uh, will help as future uh, commissions or, or committees uh, take a look at, uh, at records? Well, I just have a brief comment, and then Phil might have a more substantial one. Anybody who's ever worked with uh, classified materials looks at them and knows that different standards have been applied to the very same information. I mean, you take two documents that are covering basically the same uh, underlying data and they are classified, either one is classified and one is not, or one is classified at a higher level than the other for no apparent reason. So getting some uniformity at the least, would be very helpful. Phil? Yeah, uh, look, I think some, class, some training would be great. Uh, it's not very hard training. Um, the, uh, there are really only a few key principles to keep in mind. Uh, one, um, reputation and embarrassment is not a sufficient reason for classification. <laughs> it's not a legally permissible reason for classification. Two, uh, most reasons for classification uh, actually have a very short time half-life. Uh, usually people classify things that could indeed uh, damage the national security if they were released at that time. Usually the time and circumstances that create that sensitivity pass really fairly quickly, sometimes in a month, sometimes in a year, usually for sure by the time an administration has left office. Um, with uh, very rare and particular exceptions that might have to do with sources and methods, which, by the way, are rarely identified with enough specificity in most documents to be of interest in this context. So the, the half-life of time, the system by which the records are created and semi-automatically classified is, is so cumbersome and crude that the people who create these documents are not in a position to dial and calibrate this very well. And then the third point is that the basic standard for classification is would the release of this document damage the national security of the United States? So a good uh, way to think about it is if this document were published in the Washington Post uh, in the Washington Post tomorrow, would that publication actually damage the national security of the United States? And actually, that's a big that's a pretty high standard. Um, not will it be embarrassing, not will it be awkward, not will it be a nuisance, but would it actually damage the security of the, of the American people? And that's a pretty high standard to meet, actually. So if people are, to, are trained to that basic standard and with these other considerations in mind, I think um, it might facilitate um, the, uh, the declassification process. A lot of the uh, declassification process is plagued by a shortage of 
people who are, uh, who are trained, and by the different predispositions of the people having to do the declassification reviews, which are often contractors and retirees. And some are disposed to openness and some are not. Um, but it's a function of this board in a way to insist on applying the public interest a little more in these cases. I could. I would uh, usually agree uh, entirely with, with Philip, but having had responsibility for uh, classified operations at, uh, at justice and at defense and for classified information at energy, um, I'm not as sanguine that it, that is such a hard standard to meet that there would be damage to the, to the, uh, to the national security of the country. And I can tell you that um, Bill Clinton and Janet Reno wanted to, said that as, as a top line, they wanted to declassify as much as possible of what we held. And the arguments over single pieces of paper went into hours. And if you multiply that by the number of pieces of paper over which most national security agencies have to say grace, that's a lot of time and energy. So I, uh, I would urge you to be practical as well uh, as you are thinking about how to make more apparent to the American people what their government has and has not done. Thank you, Jamie, and Phil. I, I appreciate that insight, and uh, certainly something, you know, as the board continues about its business with uh, making these sorts of reviews, especially when they're requested by uh, members of Congress, which is which is within the board's remit, uh, we certainly will keep those types of things in mind. Uh, now we're going to move on to our uh, question uh, period. Um, we're now going to open up uh, to respond to comments and questions from the audience uh, that we've received in our uh, email box. Um, staff have been monitoring our email box uh, during the meeting, and they've received several questions and comments. Robert, uh, would you like to read the uh, first question, please? Certainly. The first question that I have is um, reads like this. I am a declassification reviewer for an executive branch agency. We are always short of resources. That means staff and technology. What do the we do the best we can? What can the PIDB do to help get us the resources we need? Thank you, Robert. Um, Alyssa, would you like to uh, take a first crack at answering that question? Sure. That is a big issue for us. We certainly recognize some of the challenges, and that's actually one of the reasons we started looking at the question of technology. So we both have this the reality that um, of the explosion of digital records, as Ben said, um, but also the fact that um, declassification uh, operations are general, generally are short staffed, unfortunately. Um, so our goal is really to think about tools. Um, and what we did actually in our report, to, uh, our report from uh, 2020 um, was to look at exactly that. So encouraging more advanced technology, um, thinking about ways that we could expedite the process um, using technology, um, and then potentially, um, you know, in, in moving forward, um, what does that look like? Um, can we use things like um, the Technology Modernization Fund um, to encourage um, to encourage uh, payment for those systems? How do we make them consistent across the uh, across the uh, the government? Um, all of those things, I think, are things that we're looking at. Um, you know, I think our goal really is to come up with a mechanism to try to come up with uniform, as uniform as possible decisions on, on declassification and classification. And we think technology can play a significant role in, in expanding that. Um, that doesn't mean that is, it is the end, that we're going to have automatic declassification by machine. Um, there, will, there will obviously be human reviewers, um, but you can certainly expedite that and potentially expand uh, consistency um, with technology. Um, so that's generally our hope, and it's certainly something that we've been encouraging uh, we've, we certainly have plans to engage with the executive branch um, and with Congress on that issue uh, in, in moving forward. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, Robert, can we move on to the next question, please? Very good. There are several questions here relating to the Kennedy assassination records. In essence, it looks like the question is, 
When, when will they be made public? They are now very old, and there is no excuse why the CIA should keep them secret. What can the PIDB do to support the declassification and release of these records? All right. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take that one. Um, and, and this is following up, obviously, on the blog post that we made uh, two weeks ago now in response to the, the, uh, the letter that we received uh, regarding these records. Um, so, and first, I'll, I'll just acknowledge, I know that this is a summary of, uh, of several questions. Um, obviously, we'll, you know, we're not going to get through. We've already received 50 questions since the event started. Uh, but we are going to post uh, responses to the questions we can't get to today on, on the blog. Let me just say that we understand, as a board, your frustration. Uh, I want to commend the archivist for his comments earlier in this meeting, and, are, and we are pleased that the National Archives is acting to support the maximum amount of declassification possible. Lately, the board has not studied this issue. Uh, it was, however, included as a recommendation <clears throat> in our 2014 Setting Priorities Report. However, the board will meet with the archives to learn more about these records and to do so before the October deadline uh, that's set by the, the, the Declassification Act on this issue uh, so that we can make uh, informed recommendations to the President. Uh, Alyssa, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add here? No, I think that's a good summary. I think, um, you know, I think that that is uh, certainly something that the, the recommendations are sort of the key from our standpoint. Um, we're, that's something that we can continue to explore. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Robert, let's move to uh, the next question. Sure. In, in addition to the items of interest from the 9-11 Commission, what other records would the board like to see prioritized for declassification? Okay. Uh, Paul Noel, do you want to, do you want to respond to this? You're on mute, Paul Noel. Uh, Although I just joined the PIDIP, I know it has long advocated for prioritizing the declassification of uh, records, certain ones that are more historically important, like the State Department does with its foreign relations of the United States series. <clears throat> and in 2014, the PIDIP asked the public to suggest topics that we should prioritize. Um, they're still interested in hearing what the public says about uh, priorities and um, uh, uh, what's really important historically. So if itemizing some of the 9-11 documents helps uh, get it out faster or get a portion of them faster, I think we should consider doing that. Obviously, there are resource constraints in the declassification field, and not every agency has a big enough staff to work on this. But I think we do need to prioritize um, this uh, as much as possible, and if we can also get smaller collections um, out at the same time uh, of documents, I think that's good. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Uh, Robert, let's move to the next question. What can the PIDB do to speed up the review of 9-11 Commission records? Okay, uh, Michael, uh, can you can you uh, take a crack at this one? Sure. I think the first issue is working through the two challenges. The first one being the antiquated review process that still exists across the executive branch. The second one is the lack of secure uh, connectivity to accelerate the pace of the declassification. Clearly, our speakers today highlighted the historically important documents that are contained in the commission report. Uh, the board has received a briefing from the archivist, as mentioned before, for legislative uh, archives and the George W. Bush Library. They're clearly engaged and working their process from their end. Um, from my perspective, addressing the challenges of the antiquated review process, the lack of the secure connectivity, and prioritizing 
the 9-11 documents are a fundamental start to speed up the review process of the 9-11 records. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Michael. Um, Robert, let's move to the next one. President Biden recently included an additional $1 billion to the government's technology modernization fund, the, the TMF. Given that PIDB's last report focused heavily on the need to modernize the classification and declassification programs and to implement technology to support that process, does the board see value in agencies using the TMF to bridge the gap? Thank you. Okay, uh, Congressman Gowdy. Yeah, Ezra, uh, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, it's a good one. I mean, among other things, uh, it's a chance for the ODNI to lead executive branch wide change. Uh, this fund, uh, the TMF, uh, is particularly well suited, I think, to help agencies who have limited funds uh, so they can develop solutions to improve classification and declassification. And in theory, the ODNI could work with National Archives and the National Declassification Center to review electronic records using automated or technology-assisted review. This is particularly important when the archives is reviewing terabytes uh, of classified presidential records. It can also help the National Archives modernize electronic record-keeping practices across government, uh, which has the effect of improving uh, public discovery, uh, as well as accessibility of electronic and digitized records. Thank you, Trey. Um, Robert, let's move to the next question. Since the digitization of information has progressed in the years after 9-11, what should the government be doing now with new technologies to make current historical records like those created by the 9-11 Commission previously easier to locate and access going forward. Uh, Alyssa, I think uh, you're best situated to answer that one. Sure, happy to answer that. And it actually follows on really well from Trey's, uh, Trey's question, I think. You know, one of the things that we have been thinking about a lot are um, whether you can use things like machine learning and AI um, to actually identify, uh, potentially identify records um, and then also um, help in the, in the classification and declassification. Um, so thinking about that a little bit, what we've seen um, across the, the government is that there are some projects out there that actually look at um, using technology uh, to improve uh, declassification decisions. Um, and so I think um, as we look at that, process. Um, our sense is that if you could expand those um, to a, a larger por portion of the government, and um, so we've seen that the Department of Energy, for example, sort of pilot projects, um, if you could expand those across the government, you actually could potentially make a significant difference. I think for us, though, one of the big challenges um, is, again, that the sort of the, the reality that the government is um, dispersed and records are dispersed. Uh, and so we really do need a, a single point who can help um, the development of technology, having consistent technology across different agencies potentially. Um, so one of the things that we recommended in our report in 2020 was having an executive agent, um, as I think has been referenced already, um, and we suggested that the ODNI in part because they can then look at, um, at different technologies and think about how those in technologies uh, interoperate across different agencies, because that is actually critical to figuring out this question. And um, what you want, in theory, if you are looking for a declassification of a set of records, is being able to search across agencies in a way from a declassification standpoint as well. So having consistent decisions across agencies requires having some sort of system that does um, take into account what's happening at other agencies. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's maybe a little bit of a long answer. Um, so we think that there's a, a very important role for technology um, in, in even the, with existing records. Um, but then, um, as, as I think has been referenced also, in future records, the more we can do now, the more we will um, ease the process for declassification down the road. So it's really uh, critical to start putting, place, putting te technology in place right now. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so I, I have a kind of a related question to this. Can you describe the, the, the form of, of, of the records uh, that the 9-11 Commission uh, generated and, and, and collected?
The uh, commission, uh, first of all, uh, collected records generated by other agencies or other other people which it took in. Uh, we made various document requests. We accessed many, many records in situ in the agencies where they were originally lodged, where we used their databases and worked in their files. Um, we did this at CIA. We did this with the Executive Office of the President. Uh, we did this a little bit with the Justice Department and FBI records and some at NSA. But um, we also brought a lot of other people's records in-house, and those were then either returned to agencies or became part of our records. Then in our in-house, we, of course, have our own emails to each other and lots of records internally in the staff, both paper and email. Um, for all of our... Uh, important interviews, we recorded those interviews in what we called MFRs, Memoranda for the Record, which were designed to create some institutional memory. You can get a very good, by the way, get very good feel for the kind of records we relied on looking at the footnotes to the 9-11 Commission report in, in that respect. So in the case of the records here, these are all, uh, so these are paper records, the MFRs. Of course, they, they may be backed up electronically in some way. And then there are successive drafts of the commission report, too, and different drafts being circulated back and forth at different stages of different chapters, which are hard to piece together, and records related to the relevant staff statements that we made and all of that. Um, but the bottom line, then, is that our, our core records are these MFRs, and here and there, there are internal memos we sent to the commissioners. For example, we sent memos to the commissioners about various document access issues, including the detainee issues that Jamie mentions. Jamie also alluded to the problems of uh, uh, presentation of the, by the Air Force and the FAA of what happened on the morning of 9-11. The commission actually created a referral uh, to the Department of Justice and IGs on, the, on that issue. That was a written document one could access. So, there are uh, written, written documents, emails, MFRs, some documents obtained from other agencies. I would, um, I would add a couple of comments, uh, Ezra. When Philip uh, mentions that we review documents in situ, it means that these documents, uh, for the most part, did not leave the relevant agencies. So if you were really trying to piece together what we saw, you would need to go to each of the constituent agencies and see what you could reconstruct. That becomes pretty important when you look for the records, for example, of the memo that Phil refers to uh, having to do with the, the presidential daily briefs. That was a record of the... Bush Administration National Security Council, and presumably it is found there rather than in our records. Uh, second, uh, I think one of the interesting sets of records would be the staff reports. The way we structured our factual findings, if you will, is that the staff made it for us uh, often in public, in the public setting of our hearings, and then we had hearings on those. And those, we didn't adopt, uh, you know, in total, everything that the staff uh, reported or found, but they are, were real-time findings that could be uh, of interest. Third, he mentions a referral, uh, and by which people should understand was meant a, a referral for potential criminal prosecution. Uh, certainly investigation by investigative agencies that had that had and have those authorities. And the last I, thing I would mention is we were on a an incredibly tight timetable at the end. And the the actual packing up of our information, which was which included the whatever the individual commissioner had, was I wouldn't call it chaotic, but it wasn't exactly the most orderly process. And therefore, I mean, certainly there were not clear filing systems integrating documents across, um, across uh, people. So uh, 
you know, that's just one thing for you to think about is if there are records that are being shipped to the archives, that there be some time in which to do that properly so that they can be searched in the future. Thank you both. That's uh, very helpful uh, to our, our, our search as we begin to search for some of the records that you identified today. Uh, let's move to the next question, Robert. <clears throat> there are lots of questions here. Would the board comment on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on agency declassification programs? I'm happy to discuss this, Ezra. Okay, great. Go ahead, Ben. Sure. So the board has not, we've not formally taken a look at the impact of, of COVID on the declassification programs, but suffice it to say, I think in our interactions with agencies uh, and observing the rules, uh, for instance, the archives has largely been almost entirely remote uh, and not permitted to go to the office during this time period. Uh, agencies have had differing policies on access to their facilities, but of course, particularly in the beginning, largely restricted to mission essential uh, personnel uh, because of the impact. So one would, of course, is going to expect that this is not going to help with the uh, backlog of the classified documents. It has certainly impacted the board's work. Uh, we have not met in person since Congress Congress reauthorized the board in December of 2019, uh, and as mentioned, we have five new members, and none of us have uh, have met in person because of the impact of, of COVID. So we look forward, uh, hopefully, to getting back to more normal operations and getting back to in person. Uh, I think this does also is yet again emphasizing the need for agencies to have electronic tools and communication systems and technology to be able to proceed with their work, whether it's uh, in a challenging setting like COVID or even under uh, normal operations. So uh, I think this uh, there will be some lessons learned from the COVID situation and hopefully, once again, emphasizing the need to modernize these systems. Thank you, Ben. All right, Robert, let's uh, move on to the next one. I'm sure I'm looking at the clock. Um, I hope we have time for at least two kind of detailed questions here. Um, the first is, what efforts are being made to apply existing technologies like better network connectivity between agencies or even artificial intelligence for locating and searching records to address the backlog in paper records? Is there anything that the White House, the executive branch, can do to uh, adapt information technology to deal with old paper records? Thanks, Robert. Okay, uh, John, do you want to take a, a crack at this? Sure. I, I sense a theme coming up there when it, uh, when it comes to me. Maybe it's the same drum that we've been banging for a while, but uh, that's a good question that we don't really know the answer to. What we do know is that the uh, Inspector General of the Intelligence Community actually had an investigation for the lack of connectivity between the Intelligence Community's uh, Freedom of Information Act components, and I think that was started in 2018, and we're not sure yet of just all the progress that's been made or not made on that. And we also know from a briefing that was given by the, the National Archives that the National Archives and the National Declassification Center, they lack secure access. So as a beginning, the, the most basic premise of this whole modernization effort is that uh, everybody needs to have a, a system uh, that allows them to have secure technology so they can communicate with one another, and they can do that electronically. Uh, that's part of it. After that, though, I, I still think we come back to the same notion that somebody has to lead this effort. And so the Director of National Intelligence, we think, surely could lead and should lead a cross agency effort that would modernize all the technology uh, and then support a more effective and efficient classification. So, yes, uh, actually, connectivity is very, very important, but it's more than that as well. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just quickly uh, ask uh, Phil or Jamie, I mean, this is, so, I mean, the 9-11 report kind of hinted at this connectivity problem between the different uh, agencies. Uh, anything you want to kind of steer us in the right direction with or, or anything you, I mean, I hate to frustrate you that, that 17 years later we're still encountering the same problems, but, but we'd, I'd love your opinion on this. 
Oh, well, I mean, my... Well, oh, sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Phil. No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> my, my impression is the connectivity is much better, that a number of fusion centers have been created. It's still a little kludgy when you see multiple uh, monitors and multiple computers on people's desks, um, but they're, they've patched it together reasonably well. I think the movement to cloud technology, um, uh, particularly if the, if, the, if the technologies can talk to each other, will help a lot um, and, and, and allow agencies that are a bit behind to skip, to skip some generations that they've missed. In general, uh, the situation has gotten better. The creation of the National Counterterrorism Center was a huge step forward in the terrorism case. It, it was a fusion center. It pooled a lot of domestic and foreign information really fruitfully and I think uh, has worked pretty well over the years. Um, we argued that need to know needed to be replaced by the mantra of need to share. What happens then is, is the pendulum oscillates. So then everyone said need to share. Then you get the Snowden case, the Manning case, and people are worried that we're sharing too much, that people are getting access to stuff they shouldn't get access to and handing it to Wikipedia. Um, and then there's a, a reaction back. There are different arguments about how to, um, how to control digital accesses now using technology in more refined ways, and which, by the way, I think is, uh, is a fruitful way to look at this so that you leave digital fingerprints when you access information, and people who want to review the, the propriety of access can go back and do that. Um, so in other words, I think the technology gives us the ability now in a way that didn't exist as much in the 1990s to do need to share in an appropriate and controlled way as long as people are purposeful about what it is they're trying to do and who needs to be in the conversation. Thank you, Phil and Jamie. I, I appreciate your insight on this. Um, Robert, I think we have time for uh, one last question. That's, that's great. If I can summarize to do justice to just one more question. Um, I, someone asked, as a researcher on the topic of 9-11, I have submitted several mandatory declassification requests for the declassification of records in this collection over, over several years. Very few have completed the MDR process. Would the presenters or the PIDB have thoughts on how to navigate this process and break the logjam in the declassification process? Well, I'll uh, make a few comments and then uh, turn to Paul Noel for his take and um, I look, uh, you know, again, the board is here to advocate for the maximum release possible uh, under the regulations. And certainly hearing this type of feedback uh, is very important to us, and it demonstrates the key public interest in making sure that there is maximum release and that these records uh, that Jamie and Phil describe in depth, uh, see the light of day, and, and knowing that there's a sticking point uh, in the process is very, very uh, helpful to us. Uh, obviously, take stepping back a level to, to, to a bit of a strategic look at it, uh, this points at a general uh, problem uh, with the antiquated nature of our system that applies to other historical issues. And so, of course, we're, we're looking at uh, advising President Biden on uh, systematic changes that may, need to be made as well. Uh, Paul, uh, Noel, anything else you'd like to add? You're on mute. Paul, Noel, you're on mute. Come on. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry. Um, normally, the MDR process is for executive agencies, um, and some of the 9-11 Commission records, or all of them, are in this sort of hybrid situation with the legislative uh, archives rather than the executive branch. And so I'm not sure how the MDR works with those documents. I'd have to look into that. But, um, yes, the MDR process in general is pretty backed up. 
So I, I guess it doesn't surprise me that this is uh, not proceeding fast through that, that mechanism. All right, great. And, and we'll uh, just a note to the staff, we're, we're going to uh, take a look at that as well as part of this process. Um, so we've run out of time. Um, first off, uh, Robert, thank you for monitoring the email inbox uh, and for reading through the questions. Um, obviously, there's still many questions that, have, uh, that we haven't been able to get to. And uh, as I said before, we'll be posting uh, answers to these questions uh, on the blog and uh, website. Uh, so if you still have a question, uh, you can send it to the PIDB email address that we uh, mentioned in the beginning, but I'll give it to you again, which is PIDB at NARA.gov. Thank you all for attending and participating in our virtual meeting this afternoon. And most importantly, uh, thank you to our speakers who uh, were so generous with their time and to the ISU staff who uh, make meetings like this possible. Thank you very much.